Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Trade the Chain. It is Tuesday, March 30th, and thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, we're back from Puerto Rico now and uh, in the studios once again. And let's see what's going on with the market. Everything looking a little bit neutral down the daily sentiment, a few bearish on the daily, but we still have that long-term sentiment of bullish and some very bullish, which is, uh, look at that, Binance coin, still very bullish. Thing doesn't yeah. stop. Um, but before I get into the legal and the plugs, if you do appreciate us, and many of you probably don't, and some of you <laughs> do, um, please hit the like button and subscribe to us if you have it. I mean, we get like between five and 10,000 views per episode and only have 12,000 subscribers. That's like backwards. So hit that subscribe if you like us, get an alert when we do our dailies and we'll be extremely happy and try to entertain you more. Ryan, off to you. The more people that like us, the harder we'll work, yes. This is just a reminder that all content provided by Trade the Chain is strictly for informational and educational purposes only. Absolutely none of this is investment advice and you should not listen to us at all. Trade the Chain is brought to you by TradeTheChain.com, a global 24-7 community of traders of all ages, all skill levels, all knowledge levels, and all backgrounds all using AI-driven sentiment indicators and actionable alerts to help them beat the market. If you too want to trade like a crypto insider and you're not yet a member of Trade the Chain, check us out at tradethechain.com for a 14-day trial. And going over to marketrebellion.com slash crypto. This is Monty and myself and our community at Market Rebellion. And with us, you get weekly trade ideas, a macro portfolio allocations, a pro charting platform, a crypto trading education curriculum, and an elite community of traders all throughout the world and much more. If you'd like to see some of our trade insights, you can sign up today for just a dollar for the first month. But uh, we've, had, we've had some good ones in the past uh, few weeks uh, with Algo, GLM, and then uh, Bitcoin going up. So with all that being said, definitely check out marketrebellion.com slash crypto. You can sign up for just a buck. But everyone, any words here before we go into the technicals? I do have a few words, as a matter of fact. Oh, you <laughs> words? Everybody, first of all, I want to let all the folks know that we are going to actually leave the house uh, collectively as a group. Uh, this year. Um, and mm. I think our first out of the house uh, group shindig is going to be down in Miami um, at the uh, Bitcoin 2021 conference, Ryan. Is that it? I think so. Yeah. It's the first week of June. Yeah. First week of June. Um, you're going to be able to catch all four of us in the flesh unless I go hide behind a bar somewhere. Um, but we will be down <laughs> there uh, with a lot of other crypto nights um celebrating the first outing uh since we all went into lockdown really i think that being think, said what's that I think, I think the really cool thing about this year is that it's a completely different market dynamic from any other bitcoin conference we've been to recently um i mean i god the last one i was at was tones with you and yeah. uh, that was bear market conditions. You know, now we're going to have Michael Saylor. We're going to have Square. We're going to have all these corporations pushing their Bitcoin narrative. So it should be very interesting to see with some of those players there. Should be exciting. Uh, and, and, and Michael Saylor boy has, uh, that's confirmed. He's going to be there. Indeed, he will. Bitcoin 2021 in Miami. Um, I think the last conference I went to actually was Consensus Invest. What was that November 2019? Wow. Jeez. A long time ago. It'll be fun. Warm weather, yeah. uh, little cocktails with uh, umbrellas in them. Um, but we'll put the link in the description uh, so you can go check that out. Mm -hmm. And Al and uh, Ryan will get a an opportunity to get an autograph from his his favorite hero, Michael Michael Saylor. Yeah, wow. <laughs> nail on the head, CJ. You got that one. Um, one thing worth pointing out, though, all of our viewers will uh, they uh, have the opportunity to take uh, advantage of a ten percent discount for uh, the conference if they buy tickets to it, though. Wow, Ryan just throwing out the the yeah. goodies already. I didn't even know about that, Ryan. You were holding that in your back pocket. Yeah, buddy. All right, it'll all be in the description. Come join us. We'll yeah, get that's pretty awesome. 
Uh, that's pretty awesome. So let's start here on the Bitcoin chart. We talked a lot about this last week, highlighting how these bottom candles have bounced off of the bottom level of these Keltner channels. One, two, and then don't you know it, three, the Keltner strikes again. <laughs> Reaper. Uh, yeah. And so that one has been a really nice indicator that has allowed us to call those bottoms. Um, now, if we look at how these trends have kind of proceeded after getting that green bullish engulfing candle at the bottom of the Keltner channel, we've had, you know, kind of a midway sideways bullish consolidation before then breaking the top band. Now, before in these previous two instances, namely here and right here as well, uh, you know, we did consolidate here, had a little bearish to neutral price action. So sure, you know, we are on a sequential nine on the four hour and may get a, a little bit of a profit taking zone now that we're hitting the uh, top Keltner channel. But, you know, I remain firm in, in kind of what we've been talking about last week. And that's the ultimate uh, bull flag target here of about 75K. I, I still think that'll likely happen in April. Uh you know, we're just kind of waiting for this bullish action to get a catalyst above the top Keltner channel. Once we get that, I think we'll probably see something uh, price action very similar to, you know, how these kind of came up after we broke above that initial band. So that's going to be kind of what I'm watching for, but something along those lines as we move towards uh, the continuation of the bull run. The thing that I will point on the weekly chart before I give it back to Monty is just that this is a beautiful chart. Um, we are consolidating here at the 62K level. Um, and each time you test this resistance level with bullish momentum, the, we the level becomes weaker in itself. Uh, you know, very simple general premise in TA, but that's what we're doing here at the 62K level. And so um, just a nice bullish to neutral consolidation. And, and I'm liking what I'm seeing from... Uh, not only the daily, but also weekly perspective. Yeah, CJ, things are looking good. And it's not just the technicals that are looking good, right? We've had kind of a landslide of positive news over just the last few weeks here. And I think today we got maybe the most bullish positive news that we'll talk about in a bit. But that was the news that PayPal is going to allow users to start spending the cryptocurrency that they hold in the app. We'll talk about that in a bit. But I think that it's not just the it's not just the news that's driving this market, right? Like CJ just pointed out, there are some very good technicals supporting this market. And we've talked a lot about the glass node data and the presence of whales in this market and the role that they've been playing. And I think that what we saw here at this very bottom of the market was the whales starting to really buy back in. We saw a record uh, outflow of Bitcoin from spot exchanges into cold storage, which is typically indicative of whales uh, stacking it away for the long term. So now for me, there's a lot less likelihood that we have this reversion. So looking at it technically, I mean, it makes sense that we're kind of running up to this level. Um, people have pointed out that we're kind of making this sort of inverse formation here. And because of that, we may retest this level of 54K before going up to 61K. But I think because of the market dynamics, just how they've changed in the last week, I think that we're not going to retest 54K. I think it's nowhere but up from here. I think by the end of this week, we'll have hit this uh, previous all-time high and most likely gone through it just because of a few factors. Like I just mentioned, these the holders that are buying here are putting it away for the long term. That's supported by all sorts of metrics, increasing number of whale wallets, uh, decreasing spot exchange supply. So this to me uh, is kind of a very strong price floor. And then obviously in combination with the fact that we had a tremendous amount of sell pressure relieved on Friday when those options expired, the market just feels completely different to start this week. So I think we're looking very good. The technicals are good. Um, the way that the buys and the sells are stacking up, I think is very encouraging for positive price action for the remainder of this week. I right. want to add something so, to that. Okay. If you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, out of all of the Bitcoin in circulation, only 12% are on exchanges. All the rest are either lost or in cold storage or just not circulating. But that is the lowest amount that we've ever seen, um, down about 4% from a year ago. 
Uh, Alex, Ryan, uh, it, from the perspective of like liquidity on exchanges, do you think that uh, like what, what what are the repercussions of not having enough Bitcoin on these exchanges? Could we be in for some like interesting liquidity crisis? It, it, all it can do is squeeze prices higher, right? Because there should be enough for buyers. If, the, if buyers outnumber sellers and you have a smaller supply, like at 12% of all circulating Bitcoin, that feels to me like it would squeeze the prices higher. Um, you might have some more trouble filling orders time to time. Coinbase may go down, but um, you know, ultimately orders will eventually get filled, even if there is some split, slippage. Yeah, and then you can take a look at the uh, the actual order books on these exchanges and see how deep you actually have to go to get certain allotment filled. Let's call it a hundred, uh, you know, even a thousand Bitcoin, and how deep you have to go into uh, price discovery on that. Um, but you know, one of the things that I've always uh, thought about that's uh, amazing and how the crypto world adapts is the fact that we have the super casino, which is a derivatives market. And those derivative mm. markets are actually negating any liquidity issues um, that Bitcoin may have because there's a lot of action. There's more action in those than there are in the actual spot trading. By the that's way, I don't know true. if you guys uh, can see, but I'm actually playing Super Mario Brothers behind Ryan on his TV, and I think I'm doing pretty well. You haven't died yet, um, so you got it going. You're, you're <laughs> rampaging through the boards. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, you know, in the in the traditional world, Alex, right, the uh, derivatives market is significantly larger than the uh, spot market. No, so I mean, that's that's a sign of maturation that the digital assets derivatives market is larger than the spot market. It should be. It, it one, also expands the playing field. Yeah, to your point. Exactly. One thing worth pointing out, actually, two things, right? Um, I'm not in disagreement at all that we appear to be entering another bullish cycle, bullish phase of the market. But there are two metrics, I think, you know, that are worth pointing out that say there might be, might not happen. And maybe I'm misinterpreting them, if, misinterpreting them rather. And if I am, please feel free to cut me down, kneecap me, if you will. Um, you know, cryptocurrency uh, fund flows, they're at their lowest level since October 20, uh, October of 2020, right? Um, Flows declined, according to a report in Coinbase, citing uh, CoinShares news, uh, CoinShares data from, it declined $79 million to only 21 million last week, right? And trading volumes in digital asset investment products have declined to 788 million per day last week. This is the first time that they've gone below 900 million per day so far this year. So that to me says that there's less institutional interest. And if we push higher, it would have to be done by retail traders. Am I wrong here? Well, that's fund flows. You you mean as in as in hedge fund flows, crypto into hedge funds? Correct. Crypto that, asset uh, investment products. You know that that's interesting. Uh, that that's what the number is. Um, you know, I was on the phone earlier today with a uh, crypto fund manager from Europe, um, very well seasoned, and he, he one of the interesting points uh, was he he's a it's a it's a derivatives fund and um they've had some relatively uh off performance uh the last two quarters um but his he's had no redemptions or no investors looking to redeem um which i found interesting and the reason being is because the underlying price of their uh contracts what they buy their contracts with like such as bitcoin have gone up so they've actually been making money even though they've been losing uh, you know, whether it's uh, short selling or something like that, because of the underlying Bitcoin going up. So I find an interesting case. I find it interesting that fund flows are off that much. One other thing worth pointing out, since you mentioned derivatives, CME Group announced earlier today, uh, micro Bitcoin futures, which now enable people to trade Bitcoin or futures for one tenth the cost of a single Bitcoin, Right. That doesn't, to me, seem like it's an institutional play. Sure, there's some institutional utility there for, you know, uh, efficiency and lower fees. But I think that that feels like they're going after, you know, like a Robin Hood crowd, like a retail crowd or a prosumer crowd. Yeah, that's a great point, Ryan. And I think that's kind of the one portion of the Bitcoin derivatives mar market that's been missing. A lot of people ask us, like, in our chat, how do we get exposure to Bitcoin futures? How do we start investing mm -hmm. in these vehicles directly? And there really isn't a way to do it unless you have a very large amount of capital. So yeah, I think they're realizing that there is demand for that kind of in between the big institution and the very small retail Coinbase trader. 
and they want to trade derivatives. So I would, I would buy some. Yeah, absolutely. I'd buy a few. I mean, it, it's, it, it makes more sense, I think, than if you're dipping your toe in the water to buy a whole Bitcoin for 60K or somewhere around there when you can buy one contract for 6K, right? Or 5,800, wherever I Bitcoin is. I think it's a smart move by CME, to be yeah. honest, with you, Ryan. I mean, to Monty's point, um, you're going to get more participants in it. And quite honestly, uh, you know, the CME bot, any of those folks over there on the regulated side just haven't been getting the volumes that they actually anticipated when they first launched with these products. So I think they're realizing now that they need to, uh, they need to get more customers to walk through the door in order for them to actually create a viable continuous use case uh, people, for what they're doing. People have short memories though, right? Like VIX, we've pointed this out before. VIX didn't immediately pick up in trading volume. It took a couple of years, three years for people to pay attention to that. Sure. I so remember the early months of Bach, they opened their doors and no one came in to grab a seat at the table. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. It's, it, it's, it takes time. None of these things happen overnight. So people shouldn't expect, you know, you flip the switch, you have futures and everyone lines up around the corner to buy, buy them. It's not going to happen. That's interesting. Hey, uh, CJ, what's going on with, um, oh, be sharing the screen. I'll just be quiet for a moment. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to highlight the uh, CME volume relative to all the others when it comes to uh, futures, at least. Um, and that's very similar with options as well. Sorry, Alex, go ahead. Mm. I don't know. What, what I, I just wanted to touch on real quick is uh, if you could pull up the, um, uh, the DeFi uh inflow chart and see if we're locking if if the you know listen we were having a little we we're having a, a, a little receding of that um that hockey stick that went up until about january uh early february i was wondering if that's changed at all um with uh d5 or if we're still following that downward trend yes the d5 pulse oh rebounding rebound now let's try to remember though how much of this is due to price appreciation or depreciation versus actual new users um what do you guys think because it looks you know ethereum's been going up quite a bit i mean ethereum's up what 35 percent over the last 30 days and seven percent over the last seven so i feel like that's more appreciation than um than anything else so what what's seven percent when you have 38 billion it looks like it's about four billion no I think, I think that. you're right ryan but it's interesting to note there's 42.4 billion locked now there was 40 billion locked like a month ago um and and two weeks prior to that 40 billion was 30 billion we if everybody remembers we were locking up a billion uh it was a billion a day um at the peak and uh, it does look like it's it's tapered off as far as inflows for locked ETH. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see kind of how that affects the price of ETH if people, like if this does plateau for an extended period of time. Um, I'm curious to see if people will start kind of taking some of that money out of the DeFi assets and maybe just putting it back into ETH or in the other uh, crypto assets like Bitcoin. But yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I expect that as kind of the next wave of retail speculation continues, I think that the value of um, USD lock and DeFi is just going to continue to increase. It seems to me like we kind of really skyrocketed up to 40 billion and we're kind of hitting a little bit of resistance there. But I think, I mean, there's just so much potential in so many of these different DeFi assets. I think that one, it's going to appeal to the retail traders during times of speculation. But even beyond that, I think the likelihood of a few of these projects succeeding and actually being uh, like having genuine utility in the future, there's actually a good chance of that. So I think overall, the sector is just kind of plateauing a little bit as uh, just a natural result of just the trajectory of the chart. I mean, still look at that one year, though. I mean, we... It almost looks exactly. like a bull flag that we're beginning to form here. And if we go look at the deep DeFi perpetual futures indexes, um, it's pretty much a very similar chart. Um, we compare those two. 
But yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, Monty. I'm still very optimistic for the increased adoption of DeFi and further price increases for the rest of 2021. Um, we'll just have to see the magnitude in which that occurs. You know, yeah, uh, it's like, sorry, go ahead, Monty. I was going to say eat gas fees, you know, they kind of rose so quickly in the last six months. I think that kind of maybe has hampered a little bit of the innovation that we saw in 2020 that kind of led to the success of a lot of these DeFi projects. I mean, I, I just think we're not seeing the rate of people building on ETH. So maybe until those gas fees go down, we're not going to see any new projects emerge. But that being said, like like you said, CJ, I think these, these current assets are going to keep appreciating in value. Oh, one quick question, just reverting back to uh, what Monty had popped up during um, the Bitcoin analysis that I uh, just hit me. I just wanted to ask your guys' opinion of this. With, with PayPal uh, ex being able to do the crypto uh, processing now, do you guys feel that's going to have a material change uh, to, to pricing or the market uh, in the short term and over between now and say the next you know, 60, 90 days, or is this a nothing burger? Nothing for now. I, I don't think anything because they haven't implemented it yet, right? The market doesn't move on news the way it used to. That announcement came out a year ago, Bitcoin probably would have shot up 15%, 20%. But if it didn't go up yet, and sorry for stepping on you there, CJ. Um, but uh, I, I just feel like if the market was going to react to it, it would have, and it hasn't. And it didn't react really to Visa either. And it's more a matter of that being implemented than anything else. Interesting. CJ, Monty, thoughts? I think, I mean, I think it is implemented, right, as of today. And so, thought, oh, okay. I thought it was happening later this year. But even so, I mean, then the article I read was factually inaccurate. But um, people have to start doing it for there to be an, a, a, an effect, no? That's, I mean, you're absolutely right, Ryan. And uh, like, I think it just comes back to the basic premise that uh, people aren't ready to spend their crypto. They're, they want to spend their USD because we kind of live in a society where USD is emphasized uh, to be spent. You know, it's meant you're supposed to spend your stimulus. Uh, but evidently, this is how the interface is looking in the app currently. Um, but anyways, yeah, I mean, we live in a society that, that uh, encourages spending and Bitcoin doesn't because it's a fixed supply. And I think yeah. people are, you know, like you wouldn't buy, you wouldn't spend Tesla stock if you thought it was going up. And, and the same applies to these assets. Although it, it is interesting. I mean, we're in a, a, a subscription membership based business uh, at Trade the Chain. And um, you know, we get a lot of inquiries as I'm sure market rebellion must as well. Like, how can you pay in crypto, you know? And so this is one of those things that may be able to, um, bridge that gap rather than doing, you know, either not taking it at all or, or not do it or, you know, not putting up with doing it manually. You know, one of the things that, um, we get call, called out on is like, Hey, why don't you take, uh, you know, process uh, crypto and you know things like a membership where it's like recurring or something like that the blockchain wasn't built to have something tag it every 30 days to pull a subscription out that's why there's no way to do that right it's a one-off type scenario but we'll, we'll see we'll see what uh paypal can come up with but this might be another additional money flow source for businesses and merchants why would anyone get into the habit of paying for things in crypto and you have to pay a capital gains tax on top of it? I, I, don't, I don't see the point. I don't know, but it's been such a bull run. The When you go through the bull runs, people are more inclined to pay with their crypto because it's almost, they feel like it's free to them. You know, it's the mentality. So, you know, during the bear, during the bear run, nobody wants to pay you in crypto. They like going to the fiat. Um, but we'll see. I mean, it's interesting. And one, one other piece of news I want to touch on that Ryan didn't because this could be fake news. <laughs> no, Alex, come on. I no. have to. I have You're to. the rube. You're the rube today. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not saying this is factual, but apparently it's, what is it, National Burrito Day? When is that, the same Ryan? same day as April 1st. Okay, same, so it's the same day as April uh, Fool's Day. Apparently, Don't. Chipotle is giving away $100,000 in Bitcoin 
but we don't actually know because it falls on burrito day, which is April 1st. And Ryan being the true to news guy he is was like, I'm not going to sh- tell people this because it could be fake, but here's your fake news of the day. Nah, man, it's real. Nah. For what it's worth, I think it's real. You can call me a rube all you want, but why would Chipotle do that? That's horrible PR. They're gonna what are they gonna pull the rug off from under us last second? Ha <laughs> ha! You get nothing. Okay, then I won't. Yeah, get well, like, like, oh. like Chipotle has shown that they different. have a mastery. Chipotle has shown that they can master the, the the PR cycle, right? Like they've they've bungled everything they've done. News facing, right? They've they've made they've made a, a mockery out of it. I mean, look what happened with the contamination scandal, and then they had other issues, and it's just like they've not they've shown that they can't handle it correctly, and. Um, this is just my opinion. This is not that of Trade the Chain or Market Rebellion uh, when their lawyers watch this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, ultimately, they haven't really been good at PR. And I might know a guy, uh, but uh, ultimately, <laughs> I, I think this is a, a, not a scam. It's not a scam. It's a joke, right? Like there were these two radio hosts in New York who like, I don't know, like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, they were in Boston at the time, actually, who kept on telling all their listeners all day they were giving away 100 grand, 100 grand, 100 grand. And like the 10th caller calls up, he loses his mind. He's telling them all the things he's going to do with all the money. And they're like, yo, man, how are you going to do that with a candy bar? Right? So like, I can see this being like a joke. I can see it not being real. All right. Well, I want to, what's that, CJ? Feels like the story's not over there. Like, (laughs) it's like those guys got chased down. Um, they, um, they ended up leaving Boston, uh, a couple months later to move to New York, to go to the radio there. But that guy was just like, he was cursing them out on the, on the air. It was, it was really funny. Yeah. That's a bad prank, man. That's a bad prank. Hopefully you get a hundred grand Bitcoin burrito or something that better not be fake news. A hundred grand lifetime supply worth of Bitcoins. I mean, of burritos. Watch it be that like, you just got a lifetime supply of burritos, which would just. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Lastly, I just want to cover uh, something. So everybody knew that Ryan and I were in Puerto Rico uh, last week, enjoying the sun and the and the palm trees and the beach. Um, but you know, one of the things we were down there for was to kind of explore what's going on in Puerto Rico, and mainly that being um, <clears throat> the Act Twenty, which has to do with a couple different things, including. Uh, taxation, as well as uh, looking at what the that capital gains uh, um, program they have, where you don't pay any uh, and stuff like that. We actually met up with a couple of cool people down there. One of our uh, members from Trade the Chain as well, uh, Lucas, who's very, very nice and selfless. And um, absolutely, Lucas is a great guy. Lucas is a fantastic guy, and he he actually is a, an Act Twenty business and um, explained to us how it all works and and whatnot. Um, We also met up with Rob from Digital Asset News uh, there as well. But Ryan, real quickly, because I, you know, before we went down there, I hadn't thought about the tax uh, regime and the capital gains uh, regime down there much. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you have it, Alex. Okay. I swear to God, listen, everybody. I've already been called a tax haven kid or whatever it is. Baby, tax haven baby. Tax haven <laughs> for being born down there. But the thing was, is that once we went down there and started hearing people talk about it, Ryan brought up a good point and we're sitting around drinking, you know, a pina colada with a little umbrella in it. He's like, you know something, if you do the calculator math, this makes so much sense. And so, you know, let's, let's just uh, round number, uh, $200,000. And I live in New York City, um, Northeast. If you make $200,000 up here, basically you just kiss 50% of it away between uh, <laughs> the highest uh, federal income tax, the uh, egregious- Hang on, let's, let's specify. Are you talking about income or capital gains? I'm done. No, this I'm uh, the, the part one is just income, like your paycheck. Okay, so two hundred thousand dollars, fifty percent of a kiss away between the highest bracket and federal tax, the most egregious uh, state tax there is. We in New York City, we have like borrow tax, MTA tax, all this tax. By the time you're done taxing, you're fifty percent gone. Okay, you talk about Puerto Rico. You hit the calculator. Two hundred thousand dollars. Your tax implications are 4%, 4%. So out of $200,000, that's 
eight thousand dollars you have to pay instead of a hundred thousand dollars. It's not. It's not quite that straightforward. There are a few hoops you have to jump through. You also have to make a ten thousand dollar donation to a, a, a charity. To you, have to, you have to. You have to. It costs about twelve thousand to set up a company there. You also have to buy a home within the first two years that you live there. It's not that straightforward, but it's Brian. definitely beneficial. I, I was glossing it over yeah. here. Now. <laughs> so you go down there and you, you, you're taxed 4%. Now that's $8,000 out of your 200,000 instead of a hundred thousand. Right now people say, well, that's really good. Yeah. And then let's say you don't want to move to a Caribbean Island for whomever type of person you are. Would you, would you, would you, if somebody came to you and said, Hey, I'll pay you um, $92,000 per year to, to live in a Caribbean Island, would you then? Because there's many different ways to look at this. It I, is, I wouldn't dismiss it. Wouldn't dismiss wouldn't it outright. Anyway, capital gains, no capital gains. Now you can't move um, there. You can't move there and and t and you've already traded the legacy stuff already is going to get taxed. But if yeah. the minute you hit the buy button and the sell button while you're down there, no capital gains. All right. Yeah. So I'm already screwed for this market cycle then. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Don't, don't try to sneak into Puerto Rico. <laughs> but I just... Uh, Ryan enjoyed himself. We, we, we enjoyed the people down there. It was great. Um, we're hoping uh, PJ and Monty uh, come visit us down there when, when we move down there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> folks, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Please, uh, if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button. Smash the like. Uh, we'd really appreciate it with the YouTube algos. Um, and we like us. you guys tomorrow on the next Trade the Chain episode. So hang on to your handlebars and happy trading, folks. Thanks, everyone.